Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to this two hour webinar discussing prevention and treatment as relates to HIV and hepatitis C uh, in West Virginia. And we are really delighted and honored uh, to present this webinar in partnership with the community education group and with my co-host, uh, Tony Young. Uh, Tony is founder and executive director of the community education group, which really leverages decades of experience uh, and, and just unbelievable substantive, you know, sort of, of uh, involvement in the HIV epidemic. Uh, and are now really um, adapting that expertise to implement successful intervention models on behalf of underserved and disenfranchised communities everywhere, including those in rural areas. And the Community Education Group has recently opened an office in West Virginia. Uh, by way of introduction, new HIV outbreaks, uh, often following hepatitis C outbreaks, have stalled the steady decline in new HIV infections in persons who inject drugs that was observed from 2000 to 2015, really making identification of and rapid response to HIV outbreaks uh, and getting prevention and treatment services to people who, who need them a fourth pillar of the national and the HIV epidemic strategy. Unlike the HIV epidemic among persons who inject drugs in the 80s and 90s, the current opioid problem is linked to a new generation uh, who are primarily white, young, and who live in non-urban settings that are poorly equipped in many uh, cases to leverage resources uh, needed to address it. The first hour of this webinar will focus on research needs for HIV prevention and treatment in West Virginia, while the second hour will focus on community perspectives on what is needed to end the HIV epidemic here. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Maureen Goodenow. Uh, Dr. Goodenow was, was appointed the Associate Director for AIDS Research at the National Institutes of Health. And she's Director of the NIH Office of uh, AIDS Research uh, in that role since 2016. She leads uh, an effort coordinating NIH HIV AIDS research agendas to end the, the pandemic the HIV pandemic, and improve the health of people with HIV. In addition, uh, she is the chief of the Molecular HIV Host Interactions Lab at NIH. Uh, Maureen has won a number of awards. Uh, most recently, uh, she was the recipient in 2019 of the Esperanza or Hope Award from the Latino Commission on AIDS for her dedication uh, to stemming the tide of HIV AIDS. Uh, prior to her government service, uh, she was a professor of pathology uh, at uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, Maureen's uh, keynote uh, address will then be followed uh, by a response from Dr. Ming Lee, and I will just introduce Dr. Lee at this time as well. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, currently is at the National Institute of General Medical Science, where he is uh, leading the uh, Institutional Development Award uh, Program and the Institute's Capacity Building Programs uh, as well. He came from the National Cancer Institute, where he was Deputy Director of the Center for Cancer Training and the Chief of Cancer Training Branch. And I want to see Dr. Lee has just been um, institute just just so important in supporting infrastructure for research that includes uh, HIV prevention and treatment research. So Maureen, I will turn the uh, screen over to you. Welcome. Thanks, Sally. It's good to see you even remotely and um, good to be uh, in virtual West Virginia. Um, so thank you very, very much for the invitation. And my only regret is that it's not in, in person. Um, we were, I think, as I recall, we were actually scheduled to come in person. And that was one of the events that got uh, closed off because of, of uh, the COVID pandemic. So um, I'm glad we're finally getting together, even under sort of unusual circumstances. It still doesn't seem normal uh, the way the last six months have been. Um, 
but I hope all of you are staying safe and are uh, well. Um, I really want to thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk about um, the NIH in general and then more specifically about the Office of AIDS Research and how all of these different research um, activities actually are, are integrated and that the structure of the OAR in particular and the NIH is you know, is really being shown to be nimble and collaborative under this current um, uh, situation that we're in. And I think that it's really important from the perspective that um, so many of the issues really are not unidimensional. They really interact and are really um, uh, interactive in terms of what's needed to address them and to solve the problems. So I'm going to go rapidly through a slide deck that mostly I'm, uh, I want to just give you an overview and also to leave you with more information than I actually go through in detail because while I'm starting off by talking, the real purpose of these um, activities is to listen and to hear from you um, and what your thoughts are and what your ideas are and what your concerns are. Um, so with that, I think someone is gonna do my slides, I hope. Uh, yes, Dr. Goodnow, I will pull up your slides and just let me know when you'd like me to advance to the next slide. Okay, great. Let me just find my, okay. All right, so we're on the first slide, which is the title slide. The next slide is uh, just an overview of four points that I'm gonna touch on. The Office of AIDS Research I mentioned. What about ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America? What about HIV related syndemics in West Virginia and NIH and COVID? And we'll put slash HIV and hepatitis C in all of these buckets. Um, a quick background um, on a, in, in the next slide. The mission of the National Institutes of Health in general is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the applications of that knowledge to advance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. And I think that's a wonderful mission when you think about it. And, and, and the relevance it has today just as much as when the NIH was founded a number of years ago. Um, the NIH is comprised of 27 different institutes and centers. The headquarters are pictured here, located in Bethesda, Maryland, um, and, but with a very large footprint, as you probably know, in the Washington, D.C. area. In the next slide, one of the 27 offices and centers at the NIH is the Office of AIDS Research, or OAR. And the vision for OAR is to advance research to end the HIV pandemic and improve health outcomes for people with HIV. And our mission is to ensure that the research funding is directed at the highest priority research areas and to facilitate maximum return on the investment. So in the next slide, it shows a schematic representation of where the Office of AIDS Research is at the NIH in its, in its organizational structure. And OAR is embedded in the office of the NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins. And it's under that umbrella that the budgetary and scientific activities of OAR filter out and, and encompass um, the large number of institutes and centers who uh, take part and have agendas that fit into um, the HIV uh, initiatives. In the next slide, the way the resources are, are deployed for HIV research is really uh, grounded in the NIH priorities for HIV and HIV related research, which um, is a document that NIH, um, OAR has developed and actually uh, revised recently. But there's basically um, four major priorities, reduce the incidence of HIV, develop the next generation therapies, conduct research towards a cure, address HIV associated comorbidities, co-infections and complications. And then cross cutting across all of these um, uh, four, uh, four focus uh, areas 
are cross-cutting areas of research that includes basic science, behavior and social sciences, epidemiology, implementation science, which is getting more and more important, information dissemination and research training. Um, and so this is um, an overview then of how, um, uh, how the uh, OAR works within the NIH. And in addition to having our research priorities, there is also um, an NIH strategic plan for HIV and HIV-related research. Next slide. And this is uh, officially launching October 1st for FY 2021, and it will be in place for five years. It's the first five-year strategic plan for the, um, the HIV agenda at NIH. And it's really developed from, um, it provides a roadmap for NIH research, HIV research. It ensures that funds are allocated based on the research priorities. And it builds on scientific progress and opportunities for advancing HIV research towards an end to the epidemic. Um, and in the next slide, what we're showing here is what has what is the history of, of HIV funding at the NIH. And you can see since the beginning of the epidemic in 1985 and the time when the Office of AIDS Research was established um, in 1988, there's been a steady increase um, up to almost $3 billion a year that's allocated for HIV research. And while that's been relatively steady, over a period of 10 or 12 years. In uh, 2019, there was a $45 million increase. And in 2020, a $25 million increase. And these have been allocated to um, high priority areas within the different topics. In the next slide, I think this is the link then between the activities and, and how we decide what to do because stakeholder views are incredibly important. Um, priority setting, strategic planning, budget allocations are all informed by stakeholder input and our stakeholders really cover a large um, a network of individuals. So inside the NIH, we have a, a council or a coordinating committee, the NAC, and many other internal NIH engagements. Outside the NIH, um, we engage with stakeholders through our advisory council, the ORAC, and working groups, requests for information, RFIs, and these listening sessions. And frankly, what happened when we did our RFIs or requests for information in preparation for revising the priorities and developing the five-year strategic plan, we got a lot of input, but it turned out when we analyzed the data that we weren't getting equal numbers or equal input from different constituents within our stakeholders. And that's when we decided that it was really important to use the official channels as well as getting out and really talking to people um, like we are doing here in West Virginia. So the listening sessions over the last year and a half or so um, and different community engagements on the next slide just shows you where we've been and about how many times or how many different um, uh, engagements that we've had in each location. Um, so we've, we've been at least from coast to coast you can see that we've been in the Southeast um, quite a bit, and uh, now here in uh, West Virginia. And this is continuing, and now that this is our second virtual um, engagement um, like this, and it's, been, it's going pretty well, and we're very excited about it because at least it gives us a chance to stay in touch and to meet new people and to keep in touch with the folks we already know. In the next slide, through these different engagements across the country, we've been actually meeting with people uh, who uh, take part in the CIFARS or the Centers for AIDS Research it's at uh, a number of the academic institutions, at the NIMH AIDS Research Centers, uh, at research centers um, uh, in minority institutions, RCMIs, historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, um, institutional development award programs, such as the one in West Virginia, the IDEA, and also with um, uh, members of the American Indians and Alaskan Native 
uh, populations and, and um, populations. Um, in the next slide, I'm going to switch gears and quickly go through some of the information and some of the outline of um, the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative, a plan for America, which was announced in 2019 in the State of the Union message and was funded starting in 2020. And the overall goal for this really amazing opportunity, once in a generation opportunity, is to reduce new infections by 75% by 2025 and 90% by 2030. And there are four key pillars, diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond, that really outline this program. And shortly, I'll show you how all of this fits together in with the NIH research agenda, which is on the next slide. So if you think about NIH research, overall, it really extends from very basic discovery, um, hypothesis-driven types of projects. And depending on the outcomes of, of that sector of the research agenda, products or ideas may move into the clinic. They may lead to translational um, uh, work in translating from the bench to the bedside. Implementation research, to say we've got a good product or a good method, how do we get it taken up so that it can have the impact it, that it should have? And the way we measure that ultimately is the impact on public health and policy. So what the way this works in a sense is that we convene and engage stakeholders through the multiple platforms that I mentioned. And OAR coordinates the NIH research activities for HIV with service delivery implementation analyze, monitor, evaluate, report, and research, uh, uh, research new strategies for program implementation. Um, so within then the whole pipeline, if you will, of, of research, the goal overall is to be able to provide products and ways for healthcare providers to um, have an impact for every single person and to maintain their health. Because if you remember the initial slide about the mission of the NIH, it's to keep people healthy and to maintain health. Um, so in terms of what we're gonna talk about more today, and I hope I'm not going too far over my time, um, in the next slide shows a quick overview that, of data that you are probably much more familiar with. And that is the HIV prevalence and the rates of HIV diagnoses um, in 2018. And this is from AIDS view. And while the numbers in West Virginia are um, in some cases not as, as high as in other parts of the country, the fact is there is a serious um, and, a, and a somewhat unique epidemic in, um, uh, in the West Virginia area. And on the next slide, it taught, we have more information that you're probably aware of and what's going on in West Virginia with about 86 or 90 new HIV diagnoses a year and about 70 acute hepatitis, case, hepatitis C cases a year. So that roughly there's over 10,000 people living uh, with hepatitis C. Uh, nationally, up to 80% of people with HIV who inject, inject drugs also have hepatitis C. Um, and in, Fiscal year 2019, NIH invested more than $59 million in HIV hepatitis research. Um, and we're part of the National HIV Hepatitis Action Plan. In the next slide, the complication I would say that is, is uh, in West Virginia uh, that's shared by some other um, rural areas is certainly the opioid misuse crisis in the United States that comes at the risk of reemergent or accelerated HIV epidemics among people who use or inject drugs. Um, and what I want to talk a little bit now quickly um, to finish up my uh, remarks are two different, uh, a series um, uh, of opportunity announcements for HIV and opioid research substance use research possibilities and talk a little bit about the HEAL initiative. So in the next slide, 
and this is, I'm not going through this in detail. I'm, I'm sure that you have access to the slides so you can look at these in, in more detail, but this is, is a, um, a tabulation of seven or eight different initiatives for funding, research funding in HIV and opioid research and or um, opioid or substance use. So this is a very big multi um, IC initiative because it, it, uh, there's a National Institute of Drug Abuse, but a lot of the research extends beyond NI, uh, NIDA. The HEAL initiative in the next slide um, has a goal to speed scientific solutions to stem the national opioid public health crisis, accelerate research across ICs, and improve treatment for opioid misuse and addiction. And this is a large um, program that is um, led through the office of the NIH director and NIDA, and there are links in the um, other parts of my talk that you can um, look at this in more detail. And then finally, if we haven't, you know, if there are not enough complications in, in uh, uh, research for HIV alone, we now have layered on top of hepatitis and the opioid crisis, uh, the COVID-19 um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, this slide shows you the prevalence of HIV on the right, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this um, uh, representation of the, of the data. And on the left shows a similar map that shows uh, the data for COVID-19. And as you can see, there is a lot of overlap um, in the different, uh, in certain parts of the country, including the South and the Southwest um, between um, the frequency of HIV infection and the frequency of COVID-19. So in the next slide, a lot of, I'm sure you've heard a lot of this, but at the NIH level, the COVID-19 response alone that has just all really developed in the last six months has been phenomenal. And the amount of support um, from Congress has been um, amazingly generous in order to really get to having a vaccine that's safe and effective as soon as possible. And so under the White House, there's Operation Warp Speed, um, uh, whose goal is to develop and make sure that there are substantial quantities of a safe, effective vaccine. And their target is January 2021. Underneath that, and at more focused at the NIH, act, at the NIH are uh, several programs, one called ACTIVE, which is Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic in Interventions and Vaccines. SEAL, which is Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities, and RADx, NIH Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Initiative for um, COVID-19. And all of these has, have proceeded at an amazing rate. You know now how many clinical trials there are for vaccines. There's a large number of, of uh, products and, and methodologies that are coming out of RADx that will help identify, diagnose, uh, and track uh, infections in, um, of, of COVID-19 in populations. Um, so this is just one aspect of, of the enormous work that's been going on in the last um, six months. Layered on in there is the, uh, are the COVID-related HIV research activities. Um, with several focuses, initial immediate impact across the NIH research and um, endeavors, how the clinical trials networks have for HIV are now contributing significantly to the clinical trials for uh, treatments and prevention and vaccines for COVID. Um, and focusing, making sure that the issues of health disparities in vulnerable populations um, are being addressed in the COVID research. And then there's been a number of generation of new HIV funding opportunities by ICs, and you can see them um, uh, listed here, and there's more information in, in, uh, about these opportunities on the websites. So then in the next slide, um, OAR itself has been doing a, a, a range of activities. 
uh, in March, right after the, the shutdown at the NIH, uh, we issued interim guidance for COVID-19 in persons with HIV. Um, OAR has been involved in the development and planning of the NIH-wide initiatives, and we, um, are represent, we represent the NIH on the President's Advisory Council for HIV AIDS, or PACHA, and uh, we also have established a COVID-19 and HIV task force that's developing near in intermediate and long-term research priorities at the intersection of HIV and COVID. So in summary, and I'm sure we'll be discussing a lot of these in more detail, West Virginia is demographically, geographically, and epidemiologically unique in the case in re relationship to the HIV pandemic. HIV, HCV, opioids, and COVID-19 convergence is concerning. And NIH looks forward to accelerating opportunities for continued and expanded engagement. Um, with that, I will uh, turn it back to Sally and uh, thank you very much. Dr. Good, no, thanks. Thanks for that really very descriptive and comprehensive overview. I'd like to ask Dr. Lee as the director of the IDEA programs uh, across uh, to then provide a brief commentary uh, as relates to West Virginia. Dr. Lee? Thank you, Sally. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Sally, and it's good to see you, Maureen. So I think it was in the summer of nine, uh, 2019, uh, Sally joined Maureen and I in Bethesda, uh, had a wonderful dinner, and, and I think there was a couple of drinks too. Um, it, it was then we, we sort of planned, contemplated to have a joint, for Maureen and I have a joint visit to West Virginia. Um, <clears throat> but for Maureen is to uh, provide some guidance and for me is really to learn the landscape of HIV research and HIV um, prevention in West Virginia. So um, I confess to both Sally and Maureen uh, many times that I'm really a novice about a HIV. My entire remark will consist two sentences. That is, I'm going to agree everything Maureen said. And I'm going to support uh, the research need, you know, everything I can do. But Sally said, no, that's not good enough. You have to do more. If you don't know what to say, I can give you a tutoring session. So, um, so I thought, you know, I'll, I'll come up with a few things that uh, uh, to sort of share with you how can we, uh, as idea program, can can be supportive of the needs. I'm going to uh, say that in the context of uh, uh, the idea uh, uh, CTR in West Virginia. Uh, First of all, I want to thank you, uh, you all. I don't have slides, by the way. Uh, you have to bear with me. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank you all for the time, uh, to spend the time, to share the time with us. And uh, I also want to congratu congratulate you all for having a very, very dynamic leader in Sally Hodder. Um, I, I think, um, I'm not saying this lightly because a lot of uh, what I learned about uh, uh, the rural health uh, and uh, the rural health need have been uh, through my working together with Sally and I, I learned from her. So one element I think as uh, Maureen just mentioned that uh, the HIV AIDS research come to uh, this age, this time, uh, the community engagement and prevention is uh, critically important. It's as important as uh, anything that has been done in the past. And I think Sally is really a great leader in this regard. And uh, the, the uh, West Virginia CTR is really leading the charge in engaging, uh, first of all, uh, among all of our uh, CTRs across the nation, there are 12 of them, 
leading the charge in incorporating and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, collaborating with the, uh, uh, practice-based research network, which is uh, an awesome force in reaching to uh, uh, rural populations, to the patients that traditionally has a lack of uh, access, uh, sometimes lack of trust to the so-called medical establishment. I think this is um, uh, critically important. And, and as I said, that uh, many of the things I, I know uh, I learned from Sally, so that uh, a testimony to that is in the newly issued IDEA CTR funding opportunity announcement, we actually required every CTR, all the CTRs to adapt these practices to include PBRNs as a required element of the program. Another aspect I want to commend Sally's uh, leadership uh, is that uh, as you, you can see probably in the, in the uh, next uh, um, hour is that her great success and effort in, in engaging the uh, state um, Department of Public Health. And I think that um, for, um, you know, medical research, before the existence of medical research, the uh, Department of uh, uh, Public Health have been doing the community engagement, com public health work a uh, long time ago. And uh, uh, in my view, the state public health department is a powerful, powerful partner in everything we do, especially in the, in the clinical and the translational research space, in um, <clears throat> a partner and with very uh, rich resource to the community and to the, with the deep understanding of the issues related to public health, in this case, particularly in HIV AIDS. So I commend Sally's effort and I really uh, encourage and welcome the State Department, uh, State Public Health Department to form a long-term uh, partnership uh, with us, with the uh, IDEA program uh, in West Virginia to, to join force to um, address the public health issues. And the third element is uh, um, also, I'm, I'm delighted to see that uh, Tony, uh, Tony Young is uh, also uh, a longtime leader of a community education, is also active partner of Sally's or the Ad IDEA CTRs. I think together, this is really enables uh, us, IDEA program and Sally's CTR to mobilize and integrate many, many forces in, in the entire state. And we, again, also made it very clear that the IDEA CTR, we fully expect the CTR is um, a statewide leader with multiple partners to address the health needs of the entire state's population. I think it is it's a daunting task the only way to, to get that done is really to mobilize the uh, various partners within the state. And again, I think there's no better leader than Sally to take a lead on that. And I also want to comment on a little bit on the uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, in light of uh, 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 Maureen's uh, uh, overview, COVID, uh, the HIV is really uh, linked to you know hepatitis C, to opioid use, and now obviously in the context of COVID-19. And um, I'm, I'm delighted to share with you, I don't know if Sally had told you that uh, through the uh, RADx um, initiative that the Maureen just mentioned, that we just issued a $5 million award to Sally and to the West Virginia CTR and I hope it is a small help. Um, 
and I happen to be leading the uh, NIH Radix Up initiative, and uh, we are going to be fully supportive. Obviously, again, uh, we fully expect Sally to deliver uh, what uh, she proposed, right? <clears throat> And also related to the COVID-19 uh, effort is, uh, I want to let you know that uh, uh, Sally is the leader of the, the entire uh, uh, IDEA CTR wide uh, registry. And also is, is a collaboration between us and, and Sally. And we uh, founded and established a nationwide idea state COVID-19 patient registry, and that will collect uh, a large volume of um, patient clinical data, uh, most of them from underserved populations and uh, communities. And um, I'm also delighted to share that through our effort and this registry, will be a critical component of the national COVID-19 cohort collaborated. That is run, also run by NIH, specifically by um, uh, 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 UNCAT. So because of the, uh, it's a great, great project. And uh, the, the um, as a, you know, you, you have a good, pro good science, good project, you actually will attract resource. And we set up this project and the, the NIH uh, data science office in the OD actually uh, come, came to me to say, Ming, can you take $1 million to support this? I was happily uh, receptive to that proposal, right? So we, we expect um, the COVID-19 uh, registry to provide uh, a vital national resource in the fight against COVID-19. And naturally, uh, I believe this will be the first uh, nationwide uh, 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 registry that covers patient data of the, the whole 24 idea state. And that will be an excellent start for anything after that. So, um, <clears throat> I want to again congratulate Sally and the West Virginia uh, CTR in taking uh, uh, nationwide leadership in, in helping us, uh, um, the whole nation actually in this case. And the, finally, I want to say the IDEA program really has a very significant uh, investment in West Virginia together with the IDEA CTR that uh, Sally uh, leads. We have an INBRI program, it's a, it's a statewide program that links up not, uh, not only West Virginia University, Marshall University, and a dozen other institutions across the state. And uh, Sally, again, is uh, playing a critical leadership role in integrating those two statewide networks, having the INBRI director PI be the associate director of IDEA CTR. And we also support a number of uh, uh, COBRI awards. Those are same centric research program to develop a competitive R1 investigators uh, for the future. So if you combine those, and we also have a uh, 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 accelerator, accelerator hop site in West Virginia, that helps translate research discoveries into um, health product and care. And together, uh, some may, may say the IDEA program really is the biggest game in town in West Virginia. We really represent the single biggest program in West Virginia among all the NIH programs. So we, um, I'm delighted that uh, uh, Sally uh, uh, is, is an excellent dynamic leader of all this. And I look forward to um, <clears throat> the specific uh, initiatives, the activities in HIV and research. And uh, we, we will, again, as I promised upfront, we'll do everything we can to be supportive.
Thank you. Uh, Ming, thank you very much for those kind words and the support, though I would say it's not so much Sally, it is the great partners, and I would like to introduce two of those who have really sort of done many, many things, COVID, HIV prevention. Uh, I will ask each of them after introducing them to just give brief comments so that we can get to the questions, and I would ask all of you to please put your questions in the chat box. We are delighted to be uh, joined by Amy Atkins. Amy is the Director of Epidemiology and Prevention Services in the Bureau of Public Health uh, in the uh, Division uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Resources, which is the State Health Department. Uh, Amy was the first author in the MMWR uh, piece that really described the HIV outbreak, recent HIV outbreak in Kabul. And she has been a tireless partner uh, throughout the COVID uh, epidemic as well. If you think that in West Virginia, you just do one disease, that's not it. You, you really deal with it all and we are delighted to have her. And secondly, Dr. Judith Feinberg, who is a, a I was gonna say an old, but I'll say a, a dear friend of mine, but she and I go back decades. Uh, Judith was one of the early project officers in Tony Fauci's uh, division that addressed AIDS in the 80s. Subsequently, she was a professor at the University of Cincinnati and was really the first to recognize opioid injection drug use uh, had emerged as a health threat there based on increased emissions with endocarditis. She uh, started the first true syringe services program in Cincinnati and you know, we were delighted and I was personally delighted when she joined us in 2015 at West Virginia University. Um, she has had a number of large awards from NIDA and from the state and has a deep experience. So if we could start with Amy and then we'll go to Judith for brief comments on uh, Maureen's presentation and Ming's comments. And then please put your questions because we'll, we'll go to questions. Uh, Amy? Yeah, so good afternoon. I'm really excited to, to be here with everyone this afternoon. And just to give you a little bit of information around, around my background, I've, I've worked um, for over 20 years in the state health department, primarily with state and local public health agencies around infectious disease, environmental health, and, and community health planning programming. Um, and entered into this position about three years ago. And, and as, as Sally mentioned, um, was immediately faced with the opportunity to work with federal and state and local partners um, to support response to an outbreak um, of HIV in, in Cabell County. And um, it really was during that time that I had the privilege and opportunity to develop a pretty strong passion for HIV uh, work and really got to know a lot of the federal, state, and local providers and um, experts in the area. Um, and um, have thought to myself, if I could go back, I would probably spend my entire career doing HIV prevention um, and programming. So I am really excited to be here. I think just to think about that experience and, and what it means for West Virginia, um, it's, um, it, it really makes me focus on the opportunity that I think the COVID pandemic response brings um, to how we uh, modernize and um, utilize this experience to, to help um, lift up some of the um, kind of rapid response needs that we're going to need to address um, the HIV um, and substance use epidemic in West Virginia. And I think there are lots of opportunities for looking at how we have rapidly scaled up um, some state level um, surveillance programming, how we've worked collectively across the system to modernize some of our approaches to disease investigation, surveillance and reporting, and think about how we might apply that um, in other infectious disease programs. Um, and I think it, it also, um, in terms of how we would work with um, more rural communities, um, really can be a good opportunity for thinking about um, how we use some of those same practices to take lessons learned from our uh, response in Cabell County, which is a more urban area, and really um, look to see what of those we can expand um, in rural communities. So I'm glad to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Dr. Feinberg, comments? Um, 
I would say that in truth, West Virginia has limited medical resources. And I think a very key step forward is the integration of care for substance use disorder, care for mental health, and care for the medical complications of injection drug use, which are in addition to overdose, primarily um, infectious diseases like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, and endocarditis. Uh, I know that SAMHSA and HRSA have um, joined forces and put some funding um, out to encourage local community health centers and federally qualified health centers to implement programs like this. That needs to be greatly accelerated. Um, there is an interest and actually a hunger uh, that I have found among um, practitioners at local um, clinic sites to be able to offer the screening and diagnosis and treatment for these problems. But there's a big education gap. For example, hepatitis C is now curable, but if you didn't graduate from your nurse practitioner or PA or doctoral program in the last four or five years, you wouldn't know a whole lot about it because it's very, very new. So there is a huge um, need to provide professional um, update, uh, updated education, as well as getting the resources out there. I think NIH through its various institutes and centers can really support this work I think by um, encouraging and prioritizing implementation research, which is really what we need to do to figure out how to make the appropriate kind of screening diagnosis and care widely accessible in West Virginia. And if we can do it here, it can be done in not only the rest of central Appalachia, which we are emblematic of, but really across rural America. Uh, we're not unique in having limited medical and substance use disorder resources in rural areas, but that is where our population is. And so that is what we really need to pursue. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can work together to try to get the right kinds of funding um, requests out that will enable us to uh, respond and to develop programs that work. We're, we're desperate for programs that will work here. Let me ask Maureen to respond to that. Um, at various times over the recent years, you know, some of the discussions at NIID were that we don't fund implementation research. Uh, when I think Dr. Feinberg's point is that is one of the major things that is needed here. Is that still the position of NIID or, or what is your feeling on that? There is really a broad agenda of implementation research in general at the NIH. A lot of ICs, <clears throat> including NIDA, National Institutes of Mental Health, um, and a number of others, uh, heart, lung, and blood, do a lot, you know, have a fairly robust portfolio in implementation research. On the HIV side and the pieces there, you know, the, the focus on the pipeline has shifted over, over time. And there certainly is um, significant implementation science research, again, at institutes like NIDA and National Institutes of Mental Health in HIV. <clears throat> the NIAD, um, I mean, each IC develops its own agenda in HIV to fit under the umbrella of, of the, the NIH objectives and strategies. So there's no obligation for any IC to do implementation science research. And I think for a long time, NIAD had other priorities in the HIV agenda, but they certainly are switching, or I would say transitioning 
more into that area, particularly in the response to um, under the initiative to end HIV in the United States um, through the CFARS. That was the initial sort of focus of phase one, if you would, of EHE. Um, and certainly a lot of the projects that were funded by supplements, both from OAR directly and through uh, NIAD um, resources have focused on or are focused on implementation um, of various modalities and approaches, particularly for say uptake of PrEP and for uh, achieving and maintaining viral suppression. Um, I think the bigger picture, the bigger question is how with a flat budget, do we move funds that, you know, from projects that may have less priority now than they did 10 years ago and get resources into other parts of the portfolio that, um, you know, are emerging as being uh, really important. Partnerships, I think, with other agencies, uh, CDC, HRSA, are really important as well so that we can leverage different activities that are going on. Um, so I think it's, a, it's an exciting time in, in the sense that we have an opportunity to, to really, and we continually look at the portfolio. But as you know, it's easier to continue projects than it is to sunset them. <clears throat> Thank you. Before I go to my co-host who has a question, I'd just like Amy uh, Atkins to respond to uh, Maureen's point about um, collaboration with other agencies such as CDC. Um, I know that there's been, I think, a robust collaboration between the Bureau of Public Health and CDC. How can we strengthen that with NIH or, or what, what do you need to further strengthen uh, collaborations with those other agencies? Yeah, thank you. I think I also want to build off of Dr. Feinberg's comments as well around integration, because I think um, integration of, of funding and really being able to um, utilize and, and integrate funding in, in a comprehensive way, being a low incidence state um, and um, a state that receives um, funding associated with that low incidence, we really do need to be able to um, put together a, an integrated package of funding that allows us to look more comprehensively at infectious diseases that impact populations with S HIV, STD, hepatitis, and really um, um, putting those funding sources together so that they work in complement. And uh, we um, received a great deal of support from CDC and HRSA through our response to Cabell County to think about how we can um, utilize and, and um, integrate those funds so that we're really able to uh, maximize um, what we can do with those. Thank you. Uh, Tony, you have a question. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thanks, Sally. And thanks, uh, Maureen, for taking time out to, to do this. I really, I really do appreciate it. And we really, really need it. Um, so, you know, one of the big challenges, uh, particularly around ending the epidemic, uh, and the response, whether that's research or, <laughs> bless you, thank you, <laughs> or, or implementation, uh, prevention, care, treatment, you know, and, and looking at this, our goal is to deconstruct the silo that exists between HIV, viral hep, and substance use disorder. And I think that we all kind of agree that that needs to happen. But when we look at something like the CDC announcement that came out last Friday for community uh, implementation of programs, West Virginia is left out of that, in part because of our uh, uh, initial surveillance and in 2017, but the very MMWR, which said that 28 of our 55 counties were vulnerable seems counterintuitive to West Virginia not being included along with Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, everyone around us, Maryland, Virginia is able to kind of apply. And so I think in a, in a research space, how do, we, how do we get West Virginia to be seen as uh, a priority population? How do we get those that are in Appalachia 
to be seen as a population in need or get its own designation as a as a, a special population that may require resources. Uh, the CDC grant prioritized people who inject drugs, but said then you need 75 or I think it was 70% people of color in a client population. That's kind of hard to achieve in a state with 4% people of color. I know that was a big question and- <laughs> <laughs> But a good question. <laughs> oh, Maureen? Well, I'm sorry that uh, someone from CDC like John O'Mormon is not here today to answer you directly. <laughs> um, one of the things I would say, just as you know, to, as a first response to this, is that the I'm I can feel your frustration, particularly dealing with the you know this influx just before COVID of ending the HIV epidemic. Um, and, and frankly, the, you know, our others, our sister agencies really have gotten the, and continue and, and rightly so the, a, a lot of the resources that the government, that the federal government has put into ending the HIV epidemic. That being said, so I think that continuing to try to build partnerships uh, with them is, is really important because they, they have the money, the amount of money that's come to NIH for that is really, you know, $6 million. So we haven't had a lot of resources. We've actually used other resources to, to sort of bolster that. But I also think that, you know, remember this is a 10 year initiative and it, it we're only in phase one. And as, as we start to see the impact of the first couple of years and that we're not achieving the overall targets, I think there's going to be more opportunity to revamp the program. It's going to have to stay nimble if it's if we're going to get to where we need to be. Um, so I wouldn't uh, sort of say, well, we're out of the game because I, if I were running it, I would say we need to keep moving and expand because we're never going to reach our targets of 50% reduction or 75% reduction if we're only looking at places where 50% of the new infections are occurring. So it's kind of the same, you know, kind of catch 22 that you mentioned from a different perspective. You know, Sally, I'd like to add something to what Tony said, which I, I think was, uh, she had a profound perspective there. And that is that West Virginia is unique in many ways, both mm -hmm. including the fact that demographically and geographically, we don't fit most kind of standard definitions of populations in need. I will tell you that we have been frustrated by submitting large grants to the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities only to be told, uh, despite the fact that socioeconomically disadvantaged and, um, and uh, poorly resourced areas are supposed to be part of that charge, only to be told that we don't have enough of a minority population to merit um, interest. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, poor rural areas are poor rural areas. And the research that needs to be done in poor rural areas really is, as I said before, not only helps West Virginia, but helps a great deal of the rest of the country. So, you know, it's hard for us, as Tom said, you know, to meet qualifications that assume that what is true in urban areas holds true across um, uh, regions and states like West Virginia that are primarily rural. I think the other piece that I would love the um, uh, Dr. Goodenow and Dr. Lee to think about from an NIH perspective is it's costly to do research in areas that are remote. There's no public transportation outside of the cities, the major cities of West Virginia, you know, to. You, you have to drive across the state to accomplish that. And, and that's another piece of the being unique pie that you know, needs to be considered um, because you cannot do easily in areas that are very sparsely populated what you can do in urban centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just would love for, from a research perspective for, for uh, NIH to think about those those pieces. Right. And I just want to add one last piece to that. I think that it's 
poverty is a health disparity. And mm -hmm. I think that we, particularly in a place like West Virginia and throughout Appalachia and throughout rural communities, poverty is a health disparity. And I think that often we don't kind of roll that into our HIV and viral hepatitis work in the same way. And when we're talking about people who inject drugs or people who are impacted by substance use disorder, often these families are taking an economic hit as well. Right. And I think that it's just, it's a consideration. I, I think we should um, end this discussion, though I think the threads will go to the next. I would just like to say, uh, before I introduce uh, Tony again, is that um, Jeanette Southerly in the text box uh, with the West Virginia Regional uh, Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education Training Center, it's a HRSA-funded uh, uh, group, um, has a statement in the chat box. She said, we'd love to help with educational components regarding implementation of HIV testing, fundamentals of HIV and other topics. And so thank you, Jeanette, for that comment. Uh, we'll close the first hour and move to the second hour. And again, I am just so pleased to uh, co-host this event with Tony Young, who is the founder and executive director of the community education program uh, that we discussed earlier. Uh, Tony is a force of nature and has been for decades. She originally um, founded uh, to provide HIV AIDS and awareness uh, and prevention services, a CEG for African American women in the early 1990s, seems like yesterday. Uh, and since that time, her organization has really evolved to advocate effectively for all at-risk communities, including rural communities. So Tony, I'm gonna turn uh, the program over to you and thank you so much for your efforts throughout the decades and for your support and collaboration. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And, you know, and I wanna thank uh, many of you that are on this call today. The National Age Strategy says something which I think is key. And that is, is that none of us can do this alone. Not the federal government, not state government, not local or county government, not community-based organizations or academia. And I think that it is really important that we always keep that in the forefront of our thinking. And so Sally, thank you. Judith, thank you. Maureen, thank you. And, you know, and I'm, I'm so happy that uh, Amy's here uh, because, you know, again, CEG believes that we have to do this together in concert with government and our other community and academic partners. Uh, so I am, I have the, the good fortune of Laura Jones, Dr. Reedy, uh, and Dr. Kilkenny, and Brooke. Uh, and, you know, I, every, I know everybody except for Brooke. So I'm, I'm probably going to go a little bit off script. I always say that when it comes to Laura Jones, if I was uh, 30 years younger, if I was in my youth, this is the program I would like to go out and build. I think it is the model. I think it is what we should be doing. Um, and she is just fantabulous. Uh, and so anybody that says something different, we will have to fight. Um, and so with uh, Dr. Reedy, I remember the first time I met Dr. Reedy, Dr. Reedy was kind of like, who are you and why do you want to come here and do what? But he sat down with me for what was supposed to be initially, I think Dr. Reedy, that meeting was supposed to last 30 minutes, uh, but I think we ended up in there almost two hours. And Dr. Reedy is with the Jefferson County, Berkeley County Health Department is a doctor, has history in the VA, which I think is a critical partner uh, in the work that we're gonna be doing going forward. Uh, and so that, in, everybody will come back and give their own introduction, but I'm, I'm giving my introductions now. And then Dr. Kilkenny, um, Dr. Kilkenny, I still think Dr. Kilkenny always worries when I call. Um, and if I'm calling to blow up the place or if I'm really calling to be uh, of support. I think that Dr. Kilkenny has done a yeoman's job in Cabell Huntington. Uh, I think he was, what was put before him was so unexpected, 
but stood up in a way that many public health, uh, I think many public health officials would have cowered from, but he made sure the community was engaged and I really think did a ton of work. Brooke is with SOAR and I know, I know Joe Solomon more than I, I know Brooke, but they're doing uh, harm reduction and needle exchange work uh, down uh, in Cabell Huntington. And again, you know, if I were a younger person, maybe what I would do with my life, but I'm old and I have gray hair and I'm not going out there. Um, so we have a couple of three questions that we're gonna go through, but maybe now y'all can do your introductions and uh, kind of wipe off some of the tarnish I may have put on your names. Um, let's start with Laura Jones. You have to, yeah, you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. As you know, um, I had gray hair when we uh, started our program. And uh, actually, I didn't have gray hair when I started working at HealthRate 20 years ago. Um, we are uh, a charitable, free and charitable clinic, um, one of six in the state of West Virginia. And when you've seen one, free and charitable clinic, you've seen one free and charitable clinic. We are all very different. Um, we operate out of Morgantown, but we serve the entire North Central West Virginia. Basically, we don't turn anyone away for health care. Uh, and about uh, 2013, we started to see an increase in hep C in our clinic. And as we were talking with folks, we realized that that um, was very much related to injection drug use. And from there, uh, we developed um, what we feel is a very comprehensive harm reduction program um, and very focused on um, the prevention of HIV and hep C. And we are somewhat controversial in that we provide, uh, we have a, a very open uh, exchange pattern. So the best practices indicate that um, giving people the number of syringes they ask for is the best way to prevent HIV and hep C. And we prefer that people bring their syringes back to us, but if they don't, they still receive clean syringes. Um, and that other programs in the state uh, don't necessarily operate that way. Um, it seems to be working for us and um, we have learned so much in the last five years about harm reduction and the prevention of HIV and Hep C and um, we have been a longtime collaborator with Judith Feinberg um, and WVU as well in terms of research. Thank you, Laura. How about you, Dr. Reedy? So I'm in the Eastern Panhandle and though we're physically far from the university uh, for delivery of HIV services, uh, we're as close as we need to be because even 15 years ago when we first uh, at the Shenandoah Community Health Center were the um, uh, uh, sub-recipient of the Ryan White grant with WVU. Uh, we've had ongoing uh, patient management with uh, Dr. Sarwari and, uh, and the other staff uh, with excellent rates of viral suppression uh, done primarily by primary care practitioners who never in person saw an infectious disease specialist. And most of the management of chronic diseases, whether it's HIV or hepatitis C or anything else, can and I think ought to be done by their primary care practitioner who should not think that this is some mystery that they have to understand all of virology. Um, what I'm especially needed from Dr. Sawari is to tell me which drug to use, what dose and how to spell it. Um, um, the, um, a lot of stuff is you know, very much uh, at the level can be done uh, by a primary care practitioner. They just need the confidence and the support of the big systems. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Brooke, how about you? 
Hey, thanks. I'm Brooke Parker, and I'm a social worker from Charleston. We're actually in Kanawha County, um, so we're Charleston, Kanawha County area, not um, Cabo Huntington, but it's totally okay. We've never met. I don't expect you to know these things. Um, so I'm a community organizer with SORN, Solutions Oriented Addiction Response, and we're a, a community grassroots group that promotes the health and dignity and voices of individuals who are impacted by drug use. And right now we uh, coordinate a low barrier mobile harm reduction program uh, due to the lack of a harm reduction program in our county. And uh, we serve 400 individuals a month. Um, we do this basically with no funding. And um, we have like two very, very, uh, two part-time contract paid positions and the rest of it is volunteer work. Um, we don't, that's how we're sustained is absolutely through volunteer work. And we're working on bigger grants, but right now it's donations. Um, our focus is to put people with lived experience at the front of our decision-making model as the experts. We absolutely hold them as the experts. Um, so the decisions and direction is decided by the people that understand the problem the best. So I come to this as a social worker and a community organizer who got, um, I got my foundation in community organizing through harm reduction and I'm a person in long-term recovery. So that's who I'm here with. Thanks Brooke. Uh, Dr. Kilkenny, are you here? I don't think Michael made it. Hey, so Amy, you're going to jump in for Dr. Kilkenny. You don't know this though. <laughs> so, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because I'm going to roll into our next question. I hope you don't mind. But because our first community question that I want to ask the panel is, given the direct correlation between HIV, substance use disorder, and viral hepatitis, how has uh, this work been impacted? How has the state's work uh, in this case, Amy's case, the state's work been impacted by this syndemic, right? And so I think the question is also for the for the panelists, and you might even throw COVID in there. How has your work been impacted by all of this? And kind of what are the are there community uh, research implications? Are there is there applied community based research that could be done? So that's one big ball of a question. So hi guys, um, I, I'll jump in here and um, share a little bit of context, I think from our work with, with Cabell County, but to step back a little bit, um, I've been in this office for the past three years, but have worked in infectious disease for um, a while, um, more as a systems and policy person. And, just to think about the impact that the substance use epidemic has had and on infectious disease programming, um, you know, we, we all see um, the impact that these diseases are having in terms of the burden um, and where West Virginia sits in terms of um, ranking for these programs. But we also see um, the capacity of our state, both at the state level and in rural communities, um, has remained level with funding, um, if not decreased. And so um, it, it really has been um, one of the greatest challenges and will be one of the, the things that we're looking to COVID resources actually to, to help us think about modernizing the way we approach um, infectious disease programming every day. Um, so thinking about how can we integrate um, funding, how can we integrate uh, the data that we have, um, how can we um, utilize funding to build capacity for COVID, both from a surveillance perspective and a disease investigation perspective um, that helps us um, improve um, identifying individuals who need, who need link to care and also making statewide data available in a more integrated fashion for public health action. Um, so, I'll, I'll start there. Um, I, I would like to just share from a Cabell County perspective um, that some of the things that we um, knew were uh, kind of key tenants of success um, as we started to work on that response um, was really the collaboration 
of the federal, state, and local partners to really come together and, and work on a rapid response and a targeted response. Um, I think the other um, couple of things that were really critical to our success was the fact that there was a lot of information about um, the people that we were trying to serve. Um, the community had done a lot of work to build relationships and knowledge about the needs and barriers. And from a state level perspective, those are things we want to um, integrate into our state planning and our state programming is more um, connectivity and um, understanding about the needs of the people that, that we need to serve. Um, and then there was a strong infrastructure there. And, and we all know and just had a, a nice discussion about um, how that we really need to try to understand how to, how to integrate some of these principles that we know work uh, in terms of integration of services and making services available wherever people are seeking them and have trusted relationships. How do we do that in rural communities where we may not have as robust of an infrastructure as we need? from the get-go. Thanks, Amy. So Judith, you wanted to say something? You have to come off of mute, okay. Yes, I thank you, because I, I really want to pick up on something that Amy said. Um, one of the things that I think has been somewhat frustrating is that, for example, We've had two outbreaks, focal outbreaks, right, of HIV, Huntington and Charleston. We have scattered cases around the state. It's been very, very difficult to convince people that, for example, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, taking medication to avoid getting HIV, um, is worthy of their time and consideration. And I think in terms of community input and community knowledge, I think we need to understand a lot better what are the issues around that? You know, is it stigma? Is it, I don't believe it, it's never been a problem in West Virginia, so it's a big problem here, so it's not in everybody's consciousness. I mean, I don't know what the answers are, but I, but I think the solution, the potential solution is finding the right way to reach people to understand what their issues are and to see if we can, you know, um, approach people in a way that is acceptable to them so that we can prevent the spread of HIV. And it's hard enough to have a lifetime chronic disease like substance use disorder and then have to layer another lifetime disease like HIV, another chronic disorder on top of it. At hep C, at least we can cure. And we just finished a PCORI study in which we showed that we could very successfully cure even active people who are actively injecting of their hep C. But we can't cure HIV yet. So it's another chronic disease on top of a chronic disease. So I, I really think there's a certain community level investigation that needs to happen so that we can we can find the right angle to approach people. So um, Judith, I think that I've thought that is it that we need to investigate it or is it that we need to implement it? Is it that we need a, a statewide implementation strategy for viral hep uh, and for hepatitis HIV screening? within that population of people who uh, are impacted by substance use disorder. Brooke, you keep going to the, the land of nod. So I'm gonna go to you. Thanks. Um, so from a, a boots on the ground standpoint, um, when the pandemic hit, the need for mobile services exploded. We uh, were serving we were making maybe 40 kits a week and going out um, finding people to serve, you know, running around uh, alleys looking for people who seemed like they needed help. And uh, when the pandemic hit, everything shut down. So no one had anywhere to go. If they were going anywhere, there was nowhere for them to go anymore. The need for us to expand our services, uh, we went from making and serving 40 people maybe to 250 and we almost run out every time we go out. And this happened, it felt like overnight. Uh, the other thing that we noticed was that because 
it's hard for people there might be services in place and there might be somewhere for people to go, but if they can't get there, there's nothing to do. What we saw happening was no one, the people that we were serving, they hadn't been seen by a medical professional. They hadn't been seen in a clinic. They, the only time they went to a hospital was for maybe an overdose. Um, they were dropped off at the hospital or EMS was called or if they were incarcerated. Uh, that's the only time they ever made contact with any kind of medical professional or any kind of testing services. And even then, maybe they went to detox, they're not always tested. So our response to it was to make uh, professional connections with people in the community. And we got the Ryan White program to come out with us and start testing. So it was a small team of people that agreed to come out on this you know, kind of a wild uh, run of a night and set up, they set up shop with us and they, they met people where they were at. And what blew me away was the first couple of nights I went out, I was the one that helped uh, Dr. Teak with the Ryan White program with testing. And every time someone would walk up and get tested, she said, I've never seen any of these people. They have never come into care. I've never seen them at the hospital. I've never seen them at a clinic or a shelter or anywhere that we've done testing. So a lot of it that we've learned is meeting people exactly where they're at because we might have resources in our community. That's not, we don't have enough resources, but they exist, but people cannot access them. Thanks, Brooke. Hey, Dr. Reedy, I know that you over in Berkeley also got hit pretty hard with a COVID response. And I'm wondering what, how that impacted you with your, uh, the work that you're doing in, with SS, your SSP, with your harm reduction program, your HIV program, and then COVID on, on top of it. So because of our proximity to Washington DC and Baltimore, it was no surprise that we had the first cases and have had sustained community transmission. We have a lot of people who commute to the DC area um, every day. Um, and we have workers who commute from Maryland and Virginia counties. Um, so we have kept uh, consistently uh, 40 to 50 new cases a week in Berkeley County since May. Um, it's had not much for occasional uh, jumps, but nothing like we've seen in some of the other cities. So it's been there all along. With that, we've become a little more accustomed. Initially, we did uh, not allow anyone to come in the building, and we had teams go out uh, to the community and would meet people and distribute them. And they did actually, you know, from about 50 a day, they may do 60 or more, but that was really labor intensive. Um, and um, uh, difficult, but as we became a little more comfortable realizing we could pump gas and we could go to the grocery store safely, uh, we reopened initially with parking lot drive through um, and then opening up and letting a few people in the building at a time for our regular syringe exchange programs. Uh, so we're back to where we were. Um, as far as spending as much time counseling, of course that varies for each individual from time to time. Um, I, my sense is it may not be quite as much because uh, we don't have as many peer recovery coaches on hand as we used to. They used to sit in the waiting room. Um, uh, so that um, touchy feely is different. Uh, we are exploring more and more using um, um, remote communication with people. Um, and our quick response team, as we get that up and going, that's going to be one of our keys is not necessarily to go to their house the next day and worry about safety, but just uh, video chat them with uh, Zoom or something else. So you know, the multiple options that six months ago, we would have thought that that is not appropriate or possible. And now we say, well, yeah, it works pretty darn good. Um, so the, um, So we're trying to look at this as new ways to do stuff, it's kind of shaken us and gotten us off our, our butts sometimes. Thank you. Laura, are you seeing, because uh, you also have a, a, a homeless encampment in Morgantown that I know that you're doing some work with. So have you seen a higher number of overdoses? How do you see the kind of, uh, the syndemic in the population that you work with, role of COVID, mobility, portability of services, 
which Brooke brought up. There you go. I just dumped it all in your lap. Thanks a lot. Let me see if I can pick something out of that. Um, so yes, we do have a, a homeless encampment. Um, that's nothing new, but this is a little more organized than usual. And uh, we've been providing a lot of service to them directly. Uh, the overdoses have definitely increased, not just among our homeless population, but among everyone uh, in, in, at least in Mon County that we know of. Uh, and we, I really think that it's related to some disruption of the drug supply for sure. Um, the, the, the difficulty that I see as we move forward is that we have a younger generation who does not see HIV as a serious threat to them. Um, and we have a difficult time convincing some of our folks that getting tested is a good idea. They're, they're much more worried about hep C, which in West Virginia is more of a reality for them. But they also don't see HIV as a disease that you're going to die from. And unlike those of us who lived through the very early wave and, and lost, you know, multiple people. So um, that's, that's been an issue for us, trying to encourage people to get tested for HIV. Um, and some of the misinformation they have is another issue. Um, we'll ask people, uh, have you been tested? Yes. Would you like to get tested today? No. How long ago were you tested? Three years ago. Um, but I don't, so I don't need to be tested. You know, those kinds of things are really uh, concerning to us in our program. And at least we're able to begin to address some of that misinformation. But I think that's something that we need in West Virginia is a, uh, a plan for PrEP in particular, implementation. And I also agree with Judith, we need to know how to present it and what kind of education do people really need? Because I think we're missing the boat in terms of um, helping young people today understand what HIV is, is really, really is and how much can impact your life. Um, Thanks. You know, we have a, only a few minutes left. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing for the fences with the last uh, question here. And that is, how can the federal government be a better research partner to West Virginia? And, you know, and I guess in this case, it's probably community participatory practice research. Is it taking science from research to, to implementation, research to action? Um, but that's the, that's the last round of questioning. Amy, you're first because of where you are on my screen. Well, I would love to hear from the community first, actually, on this one. But, you know, I do think research to action and research to, to scale up. I mean, that accelerated action is, is really critical um, for, for our response and, and really trying to figure out how we're able to take um, things that are working in communities and really rapidly and quickly scale them up um, is something we're very interested in. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Reedy. Um, I think looking at the actual problems with those trying to deliver the care and instead of devising these long drawn out studies is have some rapid cycling studies that answer specific questions on the delivery of care. Why aren't people doing the testing? You know, that if you talk about meeting people where they are, many of them are in doctor's offices for many different reasons. Doing an HIV test when you're also doing something else is so simple to do and it hardly ever gets done because not only the patients but the healthcare providers don't think we have HIV in rural America just like we don't have narcotics, right? There's no drug problem in Appalachia. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, Brooke? Uh, so I think from a, from a community standpoint, um, one thing that would be really helpful for us is if it seems like 
most communities, like we have the power to gather the people that aren't seeing doctors that aren't in regular care and that they're not housed. They're not, they're not in any type of care system. So using that, uh, using that to your benefit, I think we're to the, you know, would be a good place to start definitely. And, um, helping us estimate the, like the population of people who use drugs in somewhere like Kanawha County would be really helpful because we don't have specific numbers about that or where people are located. Um, giving us a sense of what's in our drug supply would be really, really helpful. Um, so that it's uh, helping us identify when and where fatal overdoses, bad batches, um, where use is concentrated so that we can have access to people and build the relationships that it's gonna take to get them to come into testing and to get them to come into care and stay in care. Because that's, for us, that's what we're learning is that it takes trust and rapport and a connection with people. You show up every week and we just, we care that they're safe and that they're healthy and that's it. We don't ask anything of them and that's where we're finding a lot of power and a, a lot of progress. We've been able to bring a lot of people into care just with, it's a lot of time and it's a lot of energy. Uh, it's a lot of resources, but um, we found it very worth it. Uh, I know to um, like setting up new norms for publishing epidemiological data uh, without such a long wait, like waiting a year and a half for the, um, for overdose data has been really difficult to deal with. Uh, you know, we know what we're seeing in real time out in the streets, but that's not reflected in our data uh, at all. So that's, that's difficult. Um, helping to scale naloxone education campaigns and stigma campaigns, like anti-stigma uh, campaigns would go a really long way. Um, and helping to pilot more low barrier programs and the education that I think professionals and lawmakers need about why low barrier programs are so imperative, especially when it comes to testing, um, would be where that's what we would recommend. Thanks, Brooke. And last but not least, definitely the infamous Laura Jones. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I agree with what Brooke said and what Dr. Reedy said. Um, I think that we specifically need to know a whole lot more about addressing issues with people who are currently houseless um, because we are struggling in our community and you're absolutely right Brooke we uh, we were going to house 17 people that we knew were rough sleeping in a motel during COVID and when the word got out that we were doing that we had over 50 unhoused people um, and that number has since climbed. So we are desperate for not just resources, but also best practices and ideas for engaging this particular community and keeping them in care. Um, we do a fairly decent job as a free clinic uh, because we have the ability to see people if they just walk in the door. Although COVID has kind of cramp that style a little bit. Um, and we're certainly recruiting people, we're not recruiting, but offering people in our harm reduction program the opportunity to get medical care. Um, and, and we're low barrier, as Brooke said, there's no requirement for anything, but we offer everything that we have. Um, and during COVID, we also added a um, medication assisted treatment to our program are here so that we also have the opportunity for people to come directly either from the street or into the clinic and get um, into treatment. Thanks. Brooke, you pop back up. You yeah. uh, so the, the barriers to care, um, it's, I mean, we all know this, it's really hard to want to engage in any kind of long-term treatment that requires multiple appointments or keeping track of medications when basic needs aren't met. So meeting those super, super basic needs, um, medications get stolen. And if you're in a harm reduction program that requires like a syringe exchange, like a one for one, uh, needles get stolen all the time. People can't get, can't keep track of the basic requirements to participate in such a program. And so when the basic needs aren't met, it's impossible for people to keep showing up when they're you know, they're hungry and they haven't slept. 
Um, so finding a way to meet those basic needs, I think, you know, for us when we can link people with with those resources and make sure that it's sustainable, then it's more likely that we're going to talk them into coming into care. And again, it's, it's a relationship building. Cool. So uh, to, to just quickly say that we're, we're partnering with uh, Chestnut Ridge Center and WVU to try a low barrier buprenorphine program and do some research about how that would operate and in West Virginia. So folks would come every day and pick up their um, Suboxone, similar to Methadone Clinic. And there's no requirement for counseling. It's just an attempt to get people stabilized so that, and we, we will still offer them everything, but they don't have to take any of our services unless they really want it. So we'll, we'll keep you posted on how that works out. I know one of the biggest barriers that we've seen here is trying, I know referrals that I've made for people to get into uh, medication assisted treatment or any kind of any kind of supportive service like that, they need an ID. If you don't have ID, you can't, you don't have access to anything. There's one program in Charleston that require that you don't have to have an ID for as long as you're working with another provider that that knows you basically. Um, and everyone else, you have to have an ID, it's regular drug tests, and then you're kicked out for however many weeks it is, um, which, you know, that's a nightmare for people to have to deal with. And the, the coming back without counseling, what we've seen, that's been really successful because it's it's a little bit less of an investment. It's hard to show up regularly for those things. But uh, when you have to show up every day, transportation is the issue. If it takes two hours to walk to that clinic, you can't come every day. It's impossible. Uh, so things like that are always the consideration. It's a consideration that we've, um, we've really learned about and even the struggle with like having an ID, it requires a social security card and a birth certificate. Those are impossible to get almost. Uh, I've worked with probably 75 people just in Charleston to try to get them and I think I've gotten five successfully all the way through mm -hmm. uh, and that's been six months worth of work. So just considerations. To think. So we have uh, also the, 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 the infamous uh, Dr. Uh, Sally Hodder has a, a little question for Dr. G Dr. Maureen. Uh, and that is, uh, Maureen, have you considered, to con uh, has DAIDS actually, not you, but has DAIDS considered conducting trials outside of the traditional age trial network sites? And can I, can I just sort of, of embellish that? You know, I think that across West Virginia, you know, we're not the poor brothers and sisters out here. There is just among the most dedicated men and women I've ever seen. There's the practice-based research network that uh, Ming mentioned that is supported by GMS, that uh, many of those sites have now implemented medication for opioid use disorder uh, and really have implemented effective hepatitis C and even HIV uh, treatment programs. Um, we have ECHO programs that, that help them. You know, Laura and Brooke, I think, have and Dr. Reddy have spoken eloquently about, you know, sort of the partnerships that exist, you know, in uh, certain parts of the state. And yet, you know, when you look, um, there are needs here. You know, PrEP is problematic. There are very few people on PrEP. I'm sorry, Dr. Kilkenny isn't here. You know, and he and I, I have had discussions, there are only a couple people. There are amazing new delivery prep systems coming down the road and they need to be tried in West Virginia. And just because West Virginia has had historically a low prevalence in incidents and has not been a DAIDS network, you know, those trials are not coming here. And I'm sorry, I'm on a <laughs> soapbox, but they need to come here. They're needed. <laughs> there is a network of committed individuals that would do those trials as well as any place else, including Boston, Massachusetts. So, I mean, I just would, would like consideration to bring some of those trials here. And they should be done with a community participatory practice modality, right, Sally? Well, right. No, I mean, you know, that's the great thing about the AIDS network. Having worked in Newark and I was protocol chair for 064, you know, there's always a community member or members in those protocol committees. Those protocols are not written 
without an understanding and community input. And that's why they're, they've been so successful in my opinion. And we clearly have an engaged community here to be able to do that, not just in Charleston or Morgantown, but all over West Virginia. Correct. I agree. Right. And so we are at our two hours, we're actually at two hours and seven minutes. So I'm going to kick it back to Sally. But before I do that, I want to say uh, thank you to Amy, who I put on the spot, but that's nothing new. I want to thank Laura Jones. I want to thank Brooke. I want to th thank Dr. Reedy. I definitely want to thank you, Maureen, uh, and, the, and your whole team who helped pull this together. And Sally, back to you to close us out. Right, and let me echo as well, uh, thank you to Dr. Lee, thank you to Amanda, Marcus, Cornelius, uh, Stephanie Ballard, Conrad. I mean, those are the folks that, that did the heavy lifting. And most of all, you know, thanks for, to Maureen uh, and also uh, to Ming Lee for listening and hearing some of the issues. It is just deeply appreciated. Uh, and we would love to do this again and to see some of the evolution in the thinking. Um, I just want to sort of close with, with a teaser. Um, we are doing a series of In Focus. The next In Focus session is, again, two hours on October 29th. It is COVID, what is needed in rural America, and Dr. Fauci is going to be the keynote speaker. Uh, and so we will, and we're going to have a panel including, you know, my boss, the COVIDs are in West Virginia uh, and so forth. So we really look forward to welcoming you all back. And Ming and Maureen, when you want to come back, just let us know and Tony and I will just make it happen. <laughs> I'll just give Maureen perhaps the last word. Oh, wow. Um, thank you. Uh, this has been incredible and, and certainly we've heard a lot of new ideas and comments that we haven't been hearing, as you might expect, from some of the other places that we've been visiting, just because of the very different demographics. Um, I think that the, the piece that we've just been focusing on in terms of community is really very, very critical. There's no doubt about that. And I think in looking at the screen, what it reminds me is things that I've been telling Dr. Collins recently, and that is that the HIV advocates and community look very different now than they did 30 years ago. And we need to expand the voices that he hears to reflect some of the, you know, the, the way the community looks now. Um, and I think that the questions about um, you know how to facilitate research in outside of current structures are really relevant questions and we're having some conversations already about it and I'm glad you brought it up because it really gives us an impetus and a, a uh, I can blame it on you this is what we heard so we need to follow this up um, I think there's there's a lot to be said um, about a number of your ideas and um, I, I really do want to come back. I made some notes here and I put someplace about uh, that we will plan to come back, hopefully in real time and in, in, in real, not, not virtual. And if we open up and get a vaccine and it's safe to travel, uh, you will be our first call to, because I would really love to come and, and meet you all in person and, and really have an opportunity to sit down and visit some of your facilities. And, and, uh, and if it is six to nine months, we should definitely have some progress. So thank you again for, for your fantastic conversation. One of the things that's happened as a result of going virtual with these listening sessions is that we've been able to really expand on the NIH side, the number of people who have access to meeting with um, uh, community and academics in different settings, because in the past with travel, it was not, you know, I mean, there, there are financial considerations of how many people could, could physically come, but I really, I, I can't tell who from NIAID might be on this call, but I expect to hear from them afterwards. 
um, in, in terms of some of your questions, um, because I am sure that there are NIAID and a number of other NIH people on here as well. So this is a new, uh, I think this is one of the advantages of using this kind of an approach is that we've really extended the, um, the listening part at the NIH. It's not going to rely just on OAR to disseminate what we've heard. We have a lot of other play, important players um, who are here at the table as well. So thank you again. Keep up the fantastic work. Congratulations on your new funding. I'm so excited about that for you. And um, please stay safe and, and well and, and uh, get, let's get through this immediate crisis. So thank you all very, very much. And one other thing I have to say too, Tony, I was afraid of you when I first met you too. So <laughs> you have that impact on people. <laughs> peach, I'm a peach. I know, now I know. <laughs> oh, Tony, any last uh, uh, parting comments? Um, thank you. I'm going to reach out to you about the Fauci uh, meeting because we probably want to get our rural health service provider network on, on that call. So, okay. okay. All right, folks, stay well. Thank you so much. Thank really you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.